Hey, everybody. You are about to hear a brief retelling of the movie Solstice. Before we get started, hit the like button and subscribe. It may only be a click for you, but it has a significant impact on the channel. A student, Danny, received a disturbing text message from her sister and decided to contact her parents to make sure everything was okay. However, they never picked up the phone and her sister also doesn't respond to messages. Christian, Danny's boyfriend, thinks she's worrying for nothing, while her friends convince Christian to finally break up with the girl who's constantly blowing his mind. Danny calls again, but instead of words, he hears sobbing. It turns out that the girl no longer has any family as her sister poisoned everyone with carbon monoxide. Danny became depressed, and she was left with only Christian. The young man took Danny to a party where she heard that Christian and his friends were going to go to Sweden to some village. And it had been planned for a long time. Even the tickets are already bought, and Danny found out about it only now. But the girl is afraid to make a scandal and push Christian away, because then she will be left all alone. He decided to take Denise with him. In general, the idea of the trip came to the Swede Pell. He grew up in some community where they celebrate the solstice every summer and winter. Who's that? Pronounced last year's May Queen. Pell is glad Denny will go with them and see the celebration with her own eyes. If Mark is going to gawk at the Swedish girls, Josh has come with an academic interest. He's writing his dissertation on local rituals. The company stopped in the middle of a field, the arresting young men who had left the village but returned for the solstice festival. Pell introduced the friends to his friend Ingmar. He, too, had brought with him the familiar couple Simon and Connie. Mark became nervous. It was 9 p.m. and it was light as day. Denny, on the other hand, had run off into the woods and fallen asleep there. It was already tomorrow, from the perspective of yesterday. The path to the village did not lie through the dense forest, and it was unknown whether the students would have been able to make their own way back if they had wanted to. Finally, the company found themselves in a huge clearing where the unusual village was located. It was as if the students were in another world, all the inhabitants were dressed in white, and smiles never left their faces. Pele introduced his friends to his sister, and the headman told them that they wear white dress as a sign of respect for Mother Nature and her hermaphroditic essence. The locals are very excited about the guests, and a ceremony on the platform will begin tomorrow. A crowd gathered around him. SIV took the floor and admitted that they have not had such a crowded solstice celebration in 100 years. The nine-day feast began. The old man was handed a torch and invited the spirits to return to the world of the dead from home. A red-haired girl named Maya came out and stared intently at the newcomers. Ingmar tells his friends that the locals are now playing a game of wooden-skinned fool. The redhead kicked Christian and winked at him. The boy immediately joined the round dance. He'd forgotten that it was Denny's birthday, and after all, they'd been together for four years. But Pell remembered and gave Danny a present her portrait. In a clearing, a teacher was giving a lesson in carving runes. In the distance stood a triangular building, the sanctuary, and no one is allowed to enter it. There was also a cage with a bear in it. Pell led the guests into a huge painted barracks. This is where everyone under the age of 36 sleeps. At that age, all the villagers return from their pilgrimage and stay here forever they become workers. And at 54, they become mentors. And even longer, at 72. No one lives here for nothing. The students took this as a joke. Pell reminded Christian about his birthday and slipped him a cupcake to congratulate the girl. Come on, that's enough. Why, did you think I forgot? I'm sorry, Christian said. They sleep with everyone in the barracks, and the babies have rooms put under their pillow. Tomorrow there will be some kind of ceremony called a stupa, Pell added. Christian wanted to find out what it was on the internet, but there was no connection. The day began with more obscure rituals. Tables were placed next to the shrine in a certain way. A boy struck a bell, a man and a woman of retirement age approached the tables. Finally, everyone sat down and began the meal. After a while the old men stood up again, whispering fearfully. The residents raised their shot glasses to them and drank. The old men sat down again, and they were solemnly carried away on chairs. Soon the procession stopped at the edge of the cliff. Christian is going to plagiarize writing about this congregation, which greatly angered his friend. You're being unethical, you're a leech and a slacker, and I even feel sorry for you, the friend said. But Christian didn't care, he would still take the same topic. Pell cooled Josh's fuse, still the elders wouldn't allow anything to be published about the village. Denny packed her things to get out of here as soon as possible. Why did Pell call us to such a horrible place? She asked. The boy replied that he was proud of the village and glad she had come. His parents had also died, and he was very young when he found his new family here. I grew up in a big community where there is no fighting, no dividing things into your own and other people's. I've always felt the support of a real family. Denny also deserves such a family. Unlike Christian, they will support her. I would venture to say myself that they have no right to judge people for a different culture. They need to stay here and try to settle in. 
In the middle of the night, Denny woke up to see her friends packing up and leaving without her. Good thing it was only a dream. The red-haired girl didn't him. She scribbled something on a piece of wood and put it under the bed. All that was left of the old men were ashes, which were scattered by an old dry tree. Josh found out from Pell that they were allowed to write about the village. The main thing was not to mention any names or titles. He also found out that a love rune had been planted under Christian's bed to bewitch him. The fact that Christian himself had his eye on him was also found out. Sister Pell, by the way, had already reached the age of consent. There was a scream. Mark had urinated on the very tree where the remains of the ancestors of the locals are kept, and they were outraged. Simon and Connie have already packed their bags to get out of here. They were separated for just a minute, and here the elder was no longer able to. Lying to the girl that her boyfriend had left on his own, saying there wasn't another room for her in the truck. Well, doggone it, she thought. Lunch was coming up. Denny rushed to inform Christian of this oddity, but he didn't care. He was just asking about marriages to continue the lineage here. Usually people from the outside world are invited. One girl confirmed the story about the runaway guy and invited Danny into the kitchen to make meat pies. Josh learned a lot about runes and ruber. They have hundreds of them and they are constantly adding to them. The latest book is now being filled out by Ruby. Really, he's just smearing the pages with paint and they're already deciphering them. Can I take a picture? Josh asked. No, no, no way, sorry, was the reply. Heartbreaking screams were heard, but no one paid any attention to them. Meat pies were handed out to everyone, and Denny wondered where the horse had gone. Some blonde guy told her that her boyfriend Simon had called and asked her to take her to the train station and she'd left. Mark is worried that he's now going to get nailed because of the ancestral tree in his pie. Christian discovered red pubic hair. Also, only his drink had a reddish tint to it. A girl took Mark into the woods to show him something. Josh was obsessed with Thesis and Rubinatory. At night, he left the barracks and snuck into a neighboring house to take pictures of its pages despite the strict prohibition. At that moment, Mark entered and Josh's skull was split open with a hammer. It turned out that it was not Mark, but someone had pulled his cut face over his own like a mask. This freed up two more bunks in the barracks. During breakfast, the elder reported that someone had stolen the last book of the Rebarathon, allegedly suspecting Josh. Ani and Mark had just disappeared somewhere. Christian starts to talk trash about Josh, claiming that he's the kind of person who could have stolen the book. And in fact, he and he aren't even friends. The guy's been sent to talk to SIV. And Danny's getting ready for the gala. They stirred some herbs into the water and gave each young girl a drink. It was a special tea for the competition. The wreath girls held hands and formed four circles. Denny began to hallucinate. One woman announced that they were about to dance until they fell and the one who stayed on her feet would be crowned for perseverance. The musicians joined in and all the girls started dancing. SIV sat Christian down across from her and asked him how he felt about Maya. You're allowed to mate with her astrologically, she said. After learning that the red-haired damsel had plans for him, Christian went outside. He saw a special dance in which the contestants one by one were lying on the ground and eliminated from the competition. After a while, only eight girls remained, Danny being one of them. Christian was also handed a hallucinogenic tea. Denny was spinning from the last of her strength and already had little awareness of what was going on around her. At one point she spoke in Swedish and the two remaining girls fell over. The congregation chose the May Queen. Danny was surrounded by a crowd of villagers. She thought her mom had passed by. Danny towered over everyone and she was carried to the festive table, leaving Christian alone in the middle of the clearing. The flowers on the wreath and the foliage on the throne rippled and moved as if uninvited to the table of power. Christian all proceeded to the meal and the May Queen was brought a salted herring, which she was to eat whole. The tea had already taken its toll on Christian and he couldn't figure out what was going on here. You're in our family now, the women kept saying. Denny, the red-haired maiden, got up from the table and gave Christian a meaningful look from the diners. The May Queen must now get into her carriage and go to bless the cattle and the land. Moreover, the Cathedral of Crenshaw was not allowed. The lad has another mission. He is escorted to a barracks where the elders let him inhale some smoke for vitality and invite him to impregnate Maya in a circle of other naked women. Overseeing all of this is the handsome Ruby. Danny is brought back in, and hearing the collective moans, she decides to check out what's going on in the barracks. A premonition did not deceive the girl. Danny felt sick after she peeked through the keyhole. The two Mayan queens began to calm her down in an unusual way. After Christian finished, he started running naked between the houses and saw Josh's leg sticking out of a bed. In the shed, he discovered Simon's body. His back was twisted outward and began to look like Christian's own meat wings. Sedated, the lad came to his senses. Already in the clearing you can't speak, you can't move, they told him. Clearly, the heathens sacrificed nine human lives to the sun for every life of a stranger. They will sacrifice their own lives. 
Eight people in total, and the ninth sacrifice will be chosen by the May Queen from the locals. Two old men had already been drafted, two more volunteers were Inji, Mare, and Ulf. Torbjorn was also chosen using the Lottatron. Now Denny must decide who will be the last victim, Torbjorn announced. The dead bodies were brought down and cones to others were put in their mouths, branches. Christian was chosen as the last victim. He was stuffed alive into the skin of a dead bear, cursed and promised that he would go to the burning hole. Christian and eight other victims were placed in a shrine and then the building was set on fire. Hearing the screams of the living, the sectarians panicked. Denny coughed because of the smoke and walked forward, but then stopped and looked toward the shrine. The sight of the burning building brought a smile to the girl's face. She had found her new home, 